All right, here we go. Hey everybody, we're just going to give people a, a few more minutes to get logged on, and then we'll uh, we'll start uh, soon. Thanks so much for joining us. If you've just joined, we're going to give folks a, uh, another minute or two to, to get logged on and then we'll get started. Thanks so much for being here. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Generation 180's Stand Up for EVs in recognition of National Drive Electric Week. If you've joined us to hear how humor can help accelerate the clean energy transition, then you're in the right place, uh, in the right place. We hope you brought your sense of humor. We'll try to keep it an all ages appropriate show, uh, but we're really thrilled uh, that you all could join us tonight. So thanks so much. Next slide. My name is Stuart Gardner. I'm joined by my colleague, Kay Campbell and three very funny comedians. Uh, Shakea is working behind the scenes to help pull off this event tonight. Uh, you'll meet these comedians in a moment. But before we get started, I just wanna tell you briefly about Generation 180. Generation 180 is a national nonprofit organization working to inspire and equip individuals to take action on clean energy. We're working to flip the energy script helping us move from climate doom and gloom to a story focused on clean energy, a story that says we can do this and we all have a role to play. We lead three major national campaigns, solar for all schools, electrify your ride and electric school buses. We focus on solar and EVs because they are clean energy solutions proven to address two of the largest sources of carbon emissions, electricity generation and transportation. But now you may be asking yourself, okay, uh, but why comedy? Next slide. Thanks, Stuart. Studies show comedy is uniquely persuasive and attention getting when it comes to serious issues like climate change. And as communicators, we need to get creative to inspire action on climate solutions. That's why Generation 180 created the Climate Comedy Cohort with our partners at the Center for Media and Social Impact. The Climate Comedy Cohort is a group of stand-up comedians and writers who've come together to learn and create new comedy informed by climate science and clean energy experts. The ultimate aim being to use humor to change the narrative from climate gloom and doom to we've got this. So today we're joined by three of our comedian fellows, Josh Burstein, Katie Hannigan, and Brad Einstein. I'll introduce them now, and then we will share some clips of their work so you can see them in action. Next slide, please. Josh Burstein is a stand-up comedian, journalist, and host of several web series, a digital strategist who produced content for the Obama administration and Biden-Harris campaign. Josh works at the intersection of impact, education, and entertainment. He has directed digital communications for environmental nonprofits for a good decade, including a project that had him riding across Colorado in a fully electric 18 wheeler. Josh, do you want to tell us what we're going to see when we show your clip? Sure. Uh, the clip we're using is from a recent uh, Comedy Central takeover on their socials for this climate week where uh, all of us in the cohort 
uh, we're able to make the end of the world seem a little less funny, or a little more funny, which is good. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Next slide, please. We also have with us tonight, Katie Hannigan. Katie is a stand-up comedian who performs nightly in New York City and has performed all across the US. She has been featured on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, Comedy Central, Just for Laughs, New Faces, Travel Channel, and MTV. She also co-created the Lady Journey podcast, a lifestyle podcast she co-hosts with fellow stand-up comedian, Sarah Tellamake. Katie, tell us about the videos that we're gonna see here. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here uh, at home. And it's great to be chatting about um, stand up for EVs. So I have a podcast, again, as Kay said, it's called Lady Journey. It is a lifestyle comedy podcast. And one of the elements that we have been incorporating more and more are the um, the kind of the fantasy, the delusion that we all live in, where we want to have an eco-friendly lifestyle what does that look like? What does doing your part look like? And how is it good for you? And how is it good for everybody else? So I've got two clips from that podcast and I hope you all love it. Thank you, Katie. Next slide, please. And last but definitely not least, we're joined by Brad Einstein. Brad is a comedian, writer, actor, and award-winning wilderness production consultant. Along with his creative partner, Kyle Niemer, he is a two-time National Park Service artist in residence. Past credits also include the Second City National Touring Company, Billy on the Street, Shameless, and Outside Magazine Online. Brad, could you tell us about the video that we're going to watch? You're muted, Brad. You might be muted. <laughs> That's part of the routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part of it. <laughs> I'm going to be muted the entire time. Uh, thank you so much, Kay. Yeah, so my clip, I think, is going to be a trailer of some of my past uh, work with uh, National Parks and National Forest Services. Um, you know, in, in a fun uh, turn of events, uh, uh, this this is under a name uh, currently uh, called Tree Huggers Comedy. We're changing it to Earth to Humanity. A uh, fun fact for all the folks here, uh, it was originally called Tree Huggers Comedy because back in 2017, we pitched it to High Times Online and the acronym is THC. So um, <laughs> that just stuck. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, okay. awesome. enjoy, enjoy the clip. Thanks. I don't know how long the trailer is going to be. Uh, it might get cut off halfway through, but just leave them wanting more, as they say in the biz. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, Josh and Katie, too. Thank you all for being with us today. And so without further ado, we'll now show you the clips from their work. Shakea, roll them. Experts agree installing low energy lighting not only strengthens the national grid, it also helps set the mood. Alexa, play Let's Get It On. I didn't get that. Alexa! Don't use that tone with me. I don't know how much I need this. Oh, we need the song. Just a little song right here. Play the song. Ordering rash cream. Alexa, food. play the song. Playing Let's Get It Started by Black Eyed Peas. Oh, come <laughs> Fan of the Keurig, but then after a, like a week with it, you realize how much trash and you're like, it's all plastic that you're like, this is not good. We're thinking about getting rid of it, but yeah. th then we have to throw away a bigger piece of plastic. <laughs> Deeper understanding of the climate crisis and kind of, I guess, for my own sake, my own mental uh, stability, like processing it in a way that's humorous. Yes. Well, because there's nothing like bringing a party down with <laughs> like the coral's going to die and there's nothing we can do. Forests, the glory of the world, immortal, immeasurable, enough and to spare for every feeding. Are you kidding me with this? Shit? Hell yeah! So we went to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. This is Pando. Heck yeah, baby! We got a drone permit. Hey there, Forest. How we doing? Yeah. Public land. <laughs> <laughs> 
You want to do a sit down style interview? Yeah, that'd be great. So you guys are deer ticks. Yep. How much money do you think you have spent to sleep outside on the ground? I'd like to speak to you about some allegations involving your eating habits. Definitely looked easier on paper. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you guys. That's that that sets the stage in a great way. We have um we have a number of questions for you all and also want to encourage uh folks in the audience attending. Uh if you got questions uh for our climate uh cohort comedians, put them into the QA. Uh we'll get to them as many as we can. Uh but let's let's just start. Um, you know, you all aren't clean energy experts or, or climate experts. Uh, when you went through the process of, of learning more about uh, electric vehicles and clean energy solutions, is there one thing that really stood out or surprised you as you started to kind of uh, get up to speed on this subject? Um, Katie, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I, I was surprised by many things. Um, mostly, I think a lot of the mythology that um, big oil has created around uh, the personal responsibility to recycle and um, keep your far carbon footprint low. And so I was I was kind of fascinated by the, you know, it's interesting because uh, you see it everywhere, right? With like sugar, they always are saying, oh, like, oh, sugar, you know, it's it's healthy actually, but it's just like marketing manipulation and it's done at such a, a grander scale in this context. So I was really blown away by that, but I feel empowered now that I know. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, Josh, what about you? Um, something that surprised you as you kind of start along this journey of, of learning about this topic? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've dabbled before in installing a solar panel and, and had my uh, past with NGOs, but I think the getting the gauntlet of experts that we were privy to really honed in on, um, I think, a maturity in the space in which we're not just talking about ideals. And, and of course, we still want things by 2030, by 2050, whatnot, but there's a lot more of a realism uh, to the reality of consumer behavior, um, what individuals can do that can have genuine impact, um, and you know what we should be expecting of our leaders. Yeah, love that. What about you, Brad? Something that kind of stood out that that you learned through this process? Yeah, I would I would absolutely echo uh, Katie and Josh's sentiments, especially like kind of deconstructing the the myth of personal responsibility. But I would say like on especially to the, the the folks at this meeting the thing that uh struck me so often was like these folks are some of the leading minds and leading voices in in this field in the climate change conversation and they aren't really great conversationalists to be honest like some some folks know the numbers and can't put the numbers into a sentence and if they can put the numbers into a sentence it's a sentence full of numbers and whoopsie doodle, sentences are actually made of words. And uh, not to say I have all the answers, but I think it it was very rewarding to realize like everybody has something to bring to the table. And these folks have brought a lifetime of dedication and expertise to the table, but they can't get that table over the finish line. Stay with me. That was a very bad sentence. And I'm about to say we're pretty good at sentences, but comedians occasionally are good at sentences and can and, and can boil down a lot of complex concepts into a more palatable kind of spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. And a lot of the climate change conversation is a whole lot of medicine. And I think uh, we could use a lot of spoonfuls of sugar. And as Katie said, sugar is good for you, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as you said, we could put <laughs> wheels as comedians on that table to push yes. it across the finish line. And if we put in a, a battery in, in that, on that table, that's an electric vehicle. Drives itself, exactly. Yep, it's an electric vehicle. <laughs> Katie's invented it. Segue well, that, that's, that's a perfect segue to... Um, no pun intended to my my question, which is, have you ever used um, any message before in your comedy and sort of how did that work? Is this the first time you've done this? Um, 
tell us about your experience hiding the broccoli, if you will, into your comedy. Uh, let's start with uh, Josh, how about you? Sure, I mean, speaking of past political experience, I think there's those conference rooms where it's like, there's no wrong ideas here, just throw out creative ideas. There are wrong ideas. And people who <laughs> fancy themselves communication experts, as Brad was saying, uh, may not necessarily have the best strategy of, of reaching the broadest audience. They may just know how to talk to press. And so I think where the directionality of most things you'll see about this are PSAs that um, are passed down to a creative to then kind of polish turds. Um, in comedy here, it's, it's great that we're always trying to say something. We're always trying to embed a message. Mm. Um, this is emboldening us with like the best possible, most persuasive things we should try to work in uh, which becomes uh, a great challenge and, and a bit of a game, right? If if uh, I need to insert the word penguin into every five minute bit. Penguin. Interesting, yeah, interesting point. <laughs> and Brad, how about how about you? Oh man, this is such. Uh, oh, okay. Kay, tell me to sh shut up when I'm rambling too long. But abso okay. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I I started uh, touring with the Second City like. They do a lot of social and political satire. So a lot of stuff would often have a message and dealing with that, as I'm sure Katie can speak to being on stage every night uh, to keep this family friendly, you need to get really used to eating shoot, let's say night after night after night with crowds that like you, with crowds that hate you, with crowds that just don't like you for no reason and you have to win them back. Um, being able to kind of shift tactics on the fly while still making it a show is a very difficult maneuver that all comics kind of have to learn uh, a real mm -hmm. quick I was I was uh, doing a show at the Walton Performing Arts Center uh, which is the Walmart headquarters in Fayetteville Louisiana and I uh the audience didn't like that one of the scenes was set in a target. So the next scene I did, uh, I spent the entire time yelling at the audience that they don't pay their employees a living wage and got 3000 people booing me. And that is like on purpose. And then we had to spend five minutes getting them to end up liking the fact that they were booing us. And I don't know if we changed any minds, but it certainly changed a lot of the energy in the room. And you have to be able to like dictate mm -hmm. the flow of that energy. And, and occasionally with that kind of amorphous energy comes a couple of change minds. I can't say a lot of those executives change their minds, but uh, I don't know, maybe a couple. That, that's <laughs> that's an excellent ex uh, yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, thanks for Darren. that story. And Katie, uh, what would you, how would you answer that question? Well, I have certainly had messages in my comedy that come more from my experience, uh, you know, kind of in an organic way. I, for example, once um, was uninsured and went to pick up a prescription and it was so expensive that I didn't buy it. And I turned it into a joke, you know, I and and. I wasn't necessarily intending to comment on the state of healthcare in the country, but my own experience was a commentary on it. Uh, I had another instance where, you know, we've all had this experience. You go to CVS and you put in your card and it asks if you'd like to donate one dollar to fight cancer and i just i found it so funny because cbs is a corporation that's billions and you know they make billions and billions of dollars a year so why are they asking me to help them cure cancer if they wanted to cure cancer they could just cure it it seems with the money that you know don't put it on me I, you know i'm 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 broke i'm here you know trying to buy my medicine um uh, so I have had comedy with a message I, in a way that's been less intentional than thinking, oh, I want to write mm -hmm. something for like a liberal agenda, but I'm kind of working from a place of I'm a, I'm a woman, I have a Caucasian background, I have 
liberal disposition. I live in the East Coast. I'm from the Midwest. And I think that my message just comes from my perspective um, more than saying, this is what I want and I'm going to write a message out of it. And uh, mm -hmm. I, although, you know, I'm not denigrating that as a, a way of writing. Oh, no, that, makes, that makes perfect example. sense. In, now that uh, you have kind of like, you're, you're learning more about clean energy and electric vehicles and you're starting to, you are starting to integrate some of that into your routine or just some of your narratives. How have people responded to that? Do, do people generally like, they like jokes about that or are they kind of like, wait a minute, I didn't sign up to be sitting in a lecture about climate change. How, how people responded? Uh, Josh, let's start with you. I'd say it's gotta be funny first and yeah. the message can come after that, right? And I also think it's boiling it to, uh, which uh, I'm sure everyone else can speak to is just the most universally relatable stuff like that CVS receipt that goes for miles. Like everyone knows it's a roll of toilet paper. Why are they wasting so much conservation joke? Um, and, you know, I, I think if you really get into just what's gonna resonate with people, it's like, do you like school? Do you like park? Let's not have it underwater, you know? And um, as far as building a joke around something, I think it's really just always trying to surprise and um, people are there for comic relief. Uh, they don't want to be preached to. So I, I do think that there is a balance of like maybe 80, 20 rule of uh, where you can get on your stump uh, of a dead tree and, and speak to this issue. Yeah. But they like yeah. it. Katie, uh, how about you? How have you found people respond to some of the the content around clean energy and, and climate and electric vehicles? Well, I have had a, a good response in terms of my podcast, which is, a, again, another one of the reasons that we've been moving, um, you know, more into that area, into that theme. Um, because I think when people come to podcasts, they're looking for entertainment ideas. They're looking for something that's a little bit more of an open-ended experience. Like, I'm just here chatting with my girlfriends. You know, that's kind of the experience that we're creating for people. Um, when I am performing in nightclubs, I'm not, um, you know, if it's a short joke, a one-liner, if it's something that the the audience relates to, I, I'm finding a response. But otherwise, I do see if it's kind of like something that's like along the lines of, for, for example, like climate change is here and we got to do something about it. Uh, it kind of goes over people's heads because I think of what it's a little important to remember that often people are coming to a nightclub to hear things that are like what, you know, we, the intellectuals would consider salacious, you know, sex, saying something naughty, you know, telling a guy in the front row that he looks like a virgin, you know, and that's not really my comedic styling per se, but I do think it's important to keep in mind that in the context of a nightclub, it does kind of have to fit into that, um, you know, like we had a, a, a hilarious girl in the um, cohort with us and she had a joke I, that I thought would really nail it about um, electricity and her vibrator, you know, and it's bringing two things together that people are really uh, like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden I'm paying attention now. But I've, I've even had several jokes um, I think hit really hard that I think people relate to like talking about the gas crisis and how we in New York, you know, we kind of don't have to worry about it. You know, people really like that. And um, some other things I think are helpful, even where you just mention the climate crisis and you don't necessarily have an angle that is of a liberal agenda in any way, but just mentioning it like I had, um, I know a guy, he had a joke, his name is Michael Palis Palisek, <clears throat> I think, and he told his friends, he said, like, 
I, I just got this amazing SUV and his friends were like, oh my God, like what about the North Pole? And he was like, we can drive there, you know, <laughs> playing an angle of not understanding, but even just bringing up the topic, I think is contributes to the greater social consciousness of the climate crisis being legitimized in the zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, and Brad, how about how about you? What what's the response been when you integrate this uh, climate and clean energy into your into your narrative? Absolutely, I uh, couldn't agree more with uh, with Katie, especially about just like any comment puts it into the zeitgeist. I would say specifically. Um, any any response uh is kind of a, a a good one i would i would say but specifically um when it comes to evs i would say i'm less inclined to bring up specifically evs because of the mechanism that like um most comedy will successful like the joke has to hit as as uh josh said but if you're talking about evs intrinsically because the kind of the shift hasn't happened quite yet like it's not a thing everybody has. It isn't the status quo that we are kind of poking fun at. It's this new thing that not a lot of people know about, which is an exciting thing to talk about, but not the best to joke about. And I find that a bigger target is to poke out the insanity of like gas and yeah. poke holes in, in that. Like, isn't it wild that we are continuing to just free base dinosaur bones on spoons for decades upon decades and like that gets a bigger response because everyone has that kind of status quo opinion um that said like as a part of the narrative uh i've, I've found folks are way more jazzed about that in that like um my partner and i just filmed uh we had an artist residency in alaska and this is not electric vehicle related, but uh, because there aren't a lot of roads in southeastern Alaska, it's mostly boats and planes or bears. Uh, but uh, we did manage, uh, despite it being a temperate rainforest, um, we made the entire production of like a week shooting in this temperate rainforest entirely solar generated. And like we had bits about dragging this solar generator through the mountains and it was not always the most pleasant experience, but I would say like even more so the hook for that is just folks are just interested that we pulled that off. And I think in in this particular point when that like sh transition is happening, seeing the way people interact with this, like in kind of like, oh, behind the scenes ways has has really captured attention. Um, so yeah, I would say comedy poking fun at the past and then kind of like this BTS work I've been doing has um, yeah. is really looking forward to the future. Awesome. Period. Great. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, that is that is so interesting. Um, can you guys tell us a little bit more about your process for creating comedy, you know, climate co comedy or otherwise, you know, anything you'd share, you have a formula, the setup, the punchline a bit to share about that and brad why don't we start with you okay okay um one thing that i really like is i do a lot of like stuff with, uh parodying the nature documentary form at, at least in this uh specific environmental and climate change work there are a lot of forms that we can just kind of do a comedic version of like a little bit of planet earth uh as my partner kyle likes to call it not geo and like a lot of those things with just a little twist offer a lot of like comedic language that we can communicate within um, visually and, and kind of message wise, we also like to play with all like a lot of really beautiful visuals with really dumb punchlines to, to kind of foster that cognitive dissonance that hopefully forces people to think in a slightly different way. This is really highfalutin. You saw some of the jokes earlier. It's not uh, it's not uh, it, as fancy as fancy as I'm making it sound right now. Um, but outside of that, uh, for me, I really like late night style uh, fact with a punchline. I think particularly any type of education, uh, especially in the climate space, like we can look to any late night style joke that it is a fact 
and a twist and a punchline. It helps people remember things more. It helps uh, folks kind of cling to the information a little bit better. Back to the spoonful of sugar, like fact, joke, fact, joke. It's the cleanest. It's not the most complicated bits, but it's the cleanest ones and the ones that look the best months later, I would say. Awesome. Cool. Uh, Katie, how would you respond? I, you know, I don't know that I have my process down to a T that I could um, package and uh, serve up. Um, however, I do think, you know, I do a lot of different things, but um, one thing that I am always going back to is my personal experiences. Um, like, I think maybe you guys remember I shared a, um, a story that I was actually, it was like making me laugh of when I was about 16 or 17, I had driven my parents' car to the gas station and I couldn't get the gas cap off. And I was so mortified and I was afraid to ask for help. And I just had to call my dad who had to come and like rescue me because my little hands couldn't get, you know, so I'm like, based on that alone, I would love to get an electric vehicle, you know? So I think about these times <laughs> in my life, you know, that I'm like kind of this you know, like a little bit of a strange woman in the world having awkward experiences. And when something kind of like that happens where it's um, uncomfortable in a way, or there's some kind of misunderstanding, I like to take it and see if I can process it into a joke where um, it's relatable. Because we've all had an, an embarrassing experience where, you know, we were too nervous to you know, ask someone for help and instead ended up creating a whole other drama. And um, then I will also try to um, add an analogy or something on the end to make it more like palatable as a joke. But I love to do one-liners like, like Brad was saying. I really enjoy one-liners. And um, when I am doing my podcast, basically what we're doing is we're talking broadly about a range of topics. And then when something trigger something oh I remember this is kind of like like this or this is funny it's very improvisational so like we just had Nikki Glazer on for example we were very excited and she's vegan so we talked a lot about you know vegan dating the sustainability element her vegan skincare recommendations and she was saying you know her boyfriend isn't um he isn't vegan but you know I was saying like if I was a guy and I was dating a vegan I feel that I would be seeking affirmation, you know, like, oh, I, I had a veggie burger tonight. Like, can I get a kiss? Well, I didn't say kiss, you know, cause it was a nightclub, but you guys get it, right? <laughs> Leave a little room for the <laughs> So, I mean, I'm kind of all over the place in terms of process, but a lot of it for me is like my personal experience personal. or thinking of a joke mm -hmm. in the moments. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And Josh, how about you? Yeah. A hundred percent with Katie. It, it's a lot of lived experience. Uh, as, as Brad said a little earlier, uh, you really need the knowledge first as an audience before you can in, register what is off and kilter so you can laugh about it. Um, so, you know, outside of going into Katie's audiences and, and roasting e um, one of the big things I would recommend to maybe make it about EVs is, is thinking about with with any good storytelling narrative structure um where you tell a story with brevity um that you know has a beginning middle and end and you backload the jokes see that's why they call it a punchline and then you get the little drum at the end and um i think that's a pretty basic way to think if you're trying to uh you know uh integrate comedy and into the anecdotes you might tell about your ev over dinner Okay, thank you. That's excellent. You know, we've got a number of uh, questions in the q and I'm going to start kind of integrating some of those. Uh, one is, is really interesting. You know, as comedians, you guys do a lot of talking, but I imagine you have to do a lot of listening too. Um, how has being a good listener helped you connect with people and themes that you use for your uh, creative content? Um, Brad, you want to start on this one? How is, how is being a good listener help with that? For sure. Oh my gosh. This is making me dream of the, the before times before the pandemic, but uh, it's, it's coming back. Uh, I would say particularly, uh, any show in front of a live uh, audience, um, 
it's strange. Like you both need to be able to like pick out specific audience members of your interacting with them and be able to like engage, control the situation, listen for stuff that's fun, get the entire audience on board, but then also kind of have this like sort of conductor feel where like it's almost like the audience is an orchestra that you're you're both listening to and interacting with and just kind of kind of yeah conducting for lack of a better word also um i would say developing an ear over time of like that's weird especially especially nowadays when we're talking on on um like we're we're, we're talking on zoom all the time before like if if you were talking say with an audience member and then you would get a laugh from the entire audience you're like oh that's weird let's dig into that you don't have that anymore as much when you're yeah. like talking with a scientist on zoom so i would say i'm very grateful for like years of kind of honing that skill so that outside of just the standard listening of just being able to get the information down this kind of deeper or I don't know, more instinctive type of listening of like, even amidst all the things you're trying to remember, that one's a weird thing. That's a weird thing. Let's continue to talk about, or let's dig a little bit deeper for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Katie, similar experience being a good, good listener. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Well, I agree with what Brad said. I think a big, um, pillar skill a foundational skill of comedy is being able to recognize and articulate anomalies um you know we live in a society that denies its own absurdity and i think like that's kind of what comedy is about you know pointing out like you know um we're all gonna die like isn't that crazy you know you can't even acknowledge it publicly without people being like downer you know but it's like that's kind of the nature of the world that we live in so yeah, I think listening to to find an anomaly and find things something doesn't go here, you know, one of these things isn't like the other ones. Um, but I also think um, listening in the sense of like, you know, they would call it in the in social media, like social listening of like, what are the current topics that everybody's talking about? Harry Styles, obviously. Um, you know, uh, like the Dahmer movie, everyone's talking about this, all these different things that everybody is talking about and how they relate to, um, you know, pop culture and how it relates to the human condition. I think that that can also be um, tied into the climate crisis because a lot of the nature of comedy is like commenting on pop culture phenomena you know like again like i was saying the gas crisis this past summer you know i was bringing that into my act commenting on it a lot because people were talking about it a lot and that's a way to engage people um it kind of a trick to engage people by throwing out something that they're ah oh the gas crisis that affects me you know yeah a, a commonality that's yeah totally josh uh how about you do you agree with uh Katie and Brad, uh, or is listening have no purpose whatsoever in your careers? What? No, I, I concur. Um, it's an easy one. I, I feel like something that's useful about listening well is that you can condition yourself to when the other person is still listening. So if I'm in purple places, I'm not going to have my Al Gore voice talk about climate change if we can go 45 minutes talking about rising sea levels and just selling sunshine on these roofs and this sweet ass truck like it's a it's a friggin big rig 18 wheeler and it's getting up the mountain and it doesn't have any gas in it like just um having an attentiveness to the words you use and when that gets a positive or a negative reaction and it, it specifically when you're you're thinking about these trigger points that's that's when you lose the opportunity to continue to have a two-way conversation yeah yeah that's great um i'm curious to know what you guys would say to this question what advice do you have for people who want to use humor to discuss big issues like climate change or something else hire a comedian <laughs> perfect mm -hmm. Or at least a punch up artist before you go to your Toastmaster situation. 
No, I think anybody, okay, you know, yeah, anybody can do, we've all done a bachelorette or I mean like, you know, maid of honor speech, you know, you've all done that. I think it's the, the big part of doing the speech at the wedding is incorporating the humor, telling the funny story about your friend who he like fell down the stairs in college, you know, et cetera. So I think like incorporating an experience of your own, a funny story that you had where, you know, you had your EV and then you forgot to plug it in and then, you know, whatever happened, I don't have one. So I don't know. I would love to, but um, you know, here we are, I can't afford the parking space uh, in Manhattan, but I think incorporating your own experience and thinking like, oh, is this a funny, like a little funny story? If you are the type of person that has never told a funny story in your life, then I wouldn't encourage you to incorporate humor in your speech. You know, if you're like a kind of like a funny person and you're goofy around your family, then kind of do that. Um, Josh, what would you add to that? I would, um, I'd say it's a powerful tool to break tension. And we are talking about serious things. Um, I feel like uh, back to learned experience, it's, you know, you're, you're on the bleeding edge of something new and exciting, which means you're also going to eat it sometimes, right? And so what are mm -hmm. the parts of the EV experience mm -hmm. that they're trying to poke holes and you can beat them to the punch on that so that they're one sort of um, uh, red herring is, is already defeated. Um, and then there's just like weird explorations of like what reality show like dating style needs to exist where you plug in for 30 minutes and charge your EV with three other random people all the time. Like there's, there's opportunity there. We should make that happen. That. I mean, Valentine's yeah. Day is not too far away. We have, that's like it's, that's it's awesome cuffing idea. season, y'all. Yeah. We'll <laughs> um, follow up with you about that one, Josh. Oh, Brad, okay. Brad, did you want to add anything? I would say yes, absolutely do it. Because here's the thing. You're EV drivers. You're, we're, let's just say it. You're better than everyone else. You're heroes. <laughs> you're martyrs. <laughs> I'm willing to bet at least a few of you have died specifically for my sins. Like, go ahead, tell the world about it. Tell the world. Um, no, in all, like, uh, for dues, I would say, yeah, do what makes, uh, do what you think is fun. I would say for don'ts, uh, uh, I have three uh, quick rules. One, don't be a douche. Two, if you are a douche, be really good at being a douche. And three, if you think you're really good at being a douche, get other people to confirm that so that uh, you don't do anything embarrassing. <laughs> like my wife's about to tell, tell me, you should not have said three rules. They say, keep it family. But I'll say Katie's at the vibrator. And then she's like, oh, so you're trying to deflect blame, Brad? And then I'll say, yep, and I'll be quiet. And I'll think about how I tried to deflect blame of my own actions. So Katie, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to stop talking. Uh, yeah, make jokes, make jokes. You're great, you're heroes and martyrs. I wrote down those awesome. three rules, by the way, just, just to <laughs> confirm. And and we'll share those three rules with the uh, with attendees after the uh, after the uh, tonight's event. Okay. Um, as clean energy advocates, a lot of people, EV owners, um, have had awkward to aggressive conversations sometimes with people either you encounter over the Thanksgiving dinner or. Uh, at uh, someone parked in the EV spot in, with a big pickup truck, uh, basically dealing with difficult people. And I think a, a pastime, at least for my personal pastime, I love watching videos of comedians owning hecklers. So when, when you guys do climate comedy, do you ever have people in the audience that kind of try to heckle you about that? Um, is that you know, do you get that kind of negative response? And if so, how, how do you deal with that? Um, Katie, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, I'm really fortunate to work in comedy clubs that police that type of behavior pretty strictly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's announced at the beginning of the show, they have security. So if anybody yells out, you're immediately escorted out. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have experienced it in the past. And for me, usually the way I respond to heckling, which is the same way I respond when somebody's being rude to me in real life, I just say, please don't, please don't, you know, I don't, I don't really kind of like tolerate it and draw it out into yeah. like a whole thing because I'd prefer to just perform 
Um, yeah. You know, maybe if somebody shouts out something, I'll chat with them in a, in a way that's like friendly and non-threatening. But like my comedy has, um, uh, it has a kind of, I would call it a very feminine energy uh, of love and entertainment and acceptance of everybody. So it's not something that I've experienced, but I also don't think that I invite it. Yeah. Okay. I see that. Josh, uh, you know, you strike me as someone that invites it. Um, <laughs> just, just kidding. Well, I mean, how do you, have you experienced that? Have you experienced people kind of, if you bring up uh, EVs or climate? I go into Trump country way? and call everyone racist and have them clap at the end. Uh, that's my secret power. And um, I think the, the, the difference is, is um, you don't want to, own them you don't want to pwn them you like the the outrage is a pleasure that we don't all realize we enjoy right and that's part of the problem with our current like we can text and just send something and, and be very destructive and, and not actually see the other people behind that so if you're thinking about what to say in that parking lot altercation or the family dinner we've all had to navigate it and, and there are some lost causes but it's not going to give you a whole lot to win them over uh, or to, to feel like yeah. you won there just move on and try and reach the broadest middle with with the olive branches and and so yeah. just on the tip of like how i've done that in, in a like arena of of people in in a place that voted for the other guy um if, if it's 15 minutes i'm going about 10 of it before i even mention any buzzy words before like a let's go uh, chant could could happen. And and you've already won them on these other things that they're, I think, a little more willing to hear you out. And that's, for all these conversations, that's really helpful is, is we're, we're going to talk about the commonality. We're going to talk about like my sweet whip. Like you got a problem with my brand new car. Um, fine, get a different one. I'm going to drive this and drive it for like way less money every time I don't fill up. So have a nice life. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Brad? Encountered any of that? You know, I would love to be heckled more than I do. I would say much like so much of the climate change conversation, uh, it's met more with apathy than anything else. It's either too big of a concept to really put your head around or just met with kind of sad agreement. Or like, oh, oh, is actually a fun reaction too, because you can play <laughs> play with that but like we love some heckles outside of just some ease which which can be dealt with in different ways but folks know how to deal with heckles like you said you've seen so many videos with that i would say to the point that, that, that um my other two speakers spoke to like um there's a huge social contract in a performance venue like that uh unspoken contract between the audience and the performer uh they're oftentimes either security or like front of house managers that can have your back in pretty much every space outside of the Academy Awards. But like, like you're not going to get into a physical education. I don't want to make any recommendations to anybody listening to this, especially when you're dealing with, again, a huge douche that is arguing with you in a parking lot. This person is already unstable. The only thing that I would say for you as a recommendation is is uh, I sometimes, it's not necessarily the best uh, argument to have, but like I try to out crazy them. If they're being crazy, like if they're gonna argue about an EV space in a parking lot, I'm gonna start arguing about how green grapes are the best grapes and how dare they say that red grapes are the best grapes. They didn't mention grapes at all, but I'm gonna go <laughs> hard in for green grapes until they get weirded out and leave. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's a tactic you can try. Out crazy the crazy. Mm -hmm. If that does not work, like run. <laughs> run, yeah. <laughs> um, new question. Going back for a minute to, you know, just thinking about the cohort experience and, you know, how much you learned about clean energy topics, climate science, um, and since that time, how you've started incorporating it into your comedy. Um, have certain climate solutions resonated with you more than others? Have you started thinking about you're changing some of your own behaviors or just talking to people you know about these things or how have you seen it um, exhibit itself in your in your life personally 
Um, Josh, would you like to start? Um, I, I honestly think the EV is the most substantial thing you could do that is like, everyone's an environmentalist as long as you don't have to change anything about your life, right? Like, and this is, wait, I'm gonna <laughs> save money. I got this cool new talking point. It gets me places. Um, that's dope. Uh, similarly, throw in solar on anything, all the alternative energy. Um, it just feels like these, these are the bridges that we as consumers can accelerate for all of our frustrations with the inaction of uh, leadership or corporations. It's like, um, you know, we don't want to pull any more dinosaur juice. If people stop buying dinosaur juice at large, the Q1 over Q2 corporate overlords will catch on to that and 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 hopefully incentivize uh, more innovation in the, in the spaces we want. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that as far as the individual uh, impacts, the, those are the ones that that really resonate with me. Katie, how about you? Um, well, I've definitely become more climate conscious. Uh, you know, just in terms of, I've always been a minimalist and I have kind of, um, you know, tried to maintain that as a lifestyle, but, you know, even though, um, you know, we made some like startling discoveries that uh, like many things aren't actually recycled that you would think of, you know, I've been keeping it conscious in my own life by like, as you'll remember, I was on a quest to like really diminish my use of plastic bottles. And I have to say, I think I have really done a great job of cutting way, way down on the amount of plastic bottles that I use, which I do talk about actually on this week's Lady Journey um, and my recent trip to Rome nonstop. It was a nonstop flight. Um, but, you know, I do think <laughs> that having the... Um, the vocabulary and the level of understanding that I do have now and being able to speak to people in a way that is both interesting and informative and non-threatening has probably been the biggest change that I've made, mm -hmm. you know, because, and I think we talked about this and the um, climate cohort as well, is that like, um, a big pervasive myth is this like nothing we can do, like throwing up the hands and people almost like, you know, as um, Josh was saying with, with the outrage culture, they almost like relish that depression and love feeling like there's nothing we can do. And it's the end of the world and end times. And, you know, that's something it's, it's like some kind of narcissism. I haven't diagnosed it fully yet, but, but <laughs> you know, now, instead of me saying, yeah, too bad, you know, I'm saying, well, actually, right. actually, you can do a lot of things. And one thing that I have not done yet, which I am looking into is switching over um, my investments to clean, to clean investing. So nice. um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely made it a part of my own life in a way that it wasn't before. And I feel more empowered, but I do still think and wish that I could do more. Mm -hmm. You're a comedian and you can invest in things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Brad, what would you share about your experience? Yeah, uh, I very much echoing uh, what Katie said. She reminds me of a quote that rattles around in my head a lot by Aldo Leopold, which is one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds, which I feel like works very much when you learn more about, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the biome in which we live, but also uh, when it comes to climate change that you like, you feel alone and prone to despair. And I was so grateful for learning in a group, in a cohort, so that I any moment of despair was met with brevity and in that um, spawned like a very interesting kind of process of like becoming more savvy because I think a danger of bright eyed and bushy tailed optimism in the face of this um, huge, huge, like the, the challenge of, of this and all future generations is, is to seem naive. And I think comedy is a good way to articulate no I am not naive if you want to play the depression game 
I'll beat you at the depression game. I've been playing the depression game very long and we can make it very fun. But in the making it fun, it says like, hey, I felt this. I feel this too. Now what? What are we going to do? And that laughter, when we generate laughter, hopefully everybody's laughing together. And that like intrinsically creates like a feeling of community. Like there's a reason we all love to get in a room to see a comedy show when we all get to laugh together. And I think like that process was one I was so grateful for. And I would say uh, Kyle and I, my partner, um, we have worked together on different like ecological projects for a really long time, but have done so quite alone. And we, we've had a bunch of great collaborators, but nothing like the ecosystem of communication and, and, and collaboration that we've gotten to do in this cohort. And I would say just, just the feeling that you're not alone in these feelings and the hope that that engenders has really affected like all of the ways that I'm looking at, at my, at, at my past mm -hmm. work and my future work that it's like, Hey, we got to be snark. Snark can serve a purpose, but yeah, but, but having a call to action and having a feeling of community is really important to, to include in that. Mm -hmm. Also the investment things. And if anybody on the call has got a spare EV, I'm really looking to live my environmentalism and like, I'll, <laughs> I'll drive my regular car to your place and I'll drive the EV back. Um, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll connect you. We'll, we'll definitely great. have awesome. some people reaching out. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. Cool, cool. Great. Last, There's last, a lot of people in the chat just being like, I want to give Brad a free car shirt. <laughs> last, last question. We've moved into lightning round. Last question before Kay tells us what we can do. Uh, last question. Uh, briefly, when thinking about climate, clean energy, electric vehicles, what makes you optimistic for the future? Josh, go. Um, honestly, that uh, as Brad was saying, that there's a sense of community. I think we all are, are, are wising up to it and, and finding our ways. And what I see here is the opportunity for a, a bunch of people to start their EV biker gangs and go get barbecue together and, and, and save their local communities one uh, car conversion at a time. Awesome. Katie, how about you? Well, I mean, I've been seeing a lot of ads for new electric cars coming out cheaper. And for me, I, I'm like, okay, the transition is happening. It's already happening. The climate consciousness is happening. And I I think that it's only a matter of time before, you know, we start fully transitioning. Nice. Brad? Yeah, I would say absolutely like the the point that we're in and how close we are to the tipping point. I think it was either Kay or Wendy at a talk that we had about ovens. And one of them said, uh, in the future, people are going to think we're absolutely insane for just burning gas in our house. And I that has always dwelt with me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a wild thing that we all do. And cars are just that times uh, the, I don't know. You, I don't do the numbers. The scientists do the numbers. Cars are really big ovens, is what I guess what I'm saying. And it's going to be so much more impactful once the EV transition fully comes. Awesome. Well said. Um, Thank you. Well, it? Cool. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I'm going with it. Yes. Um, so uh, before we wrap up, uh, I'm, I'm supposing you're asking yourselves, what can I do? Um, so here are two options. Shakea, if you can put the slide deck back up. There we go. Um, one is to um, sign the pledge to make your next car electric by visiting um, bit.ly slash standup EV. The link is also here in the chat um, or someone will put it in if they haven't yet. Um, and you can also sign up for the Friday Funny to receive more climate comedy by visiting climatecomedycohort.org. Um, so with that, with that, I'll say thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much to our comedian panel for being here tonight. And we wish you all a great night. Thank you. Thanks, thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you again, everybody. Night. Pleasure to meet you. Or, or talk. Bye, everybody. Didn't meet. <laughs>